props or whatever. Good one. Yeah, distractions are bad. In the name of Jesus, amen. Do you remember the first time you ever saw a mountain? I do. I sure do. I think I was about fourth grade when my family from Indiana, we took our big trip out west, and we came up through the northern route. We went to northern Illinois and then to Iowa. I'm looking at a map in my head. Into Iowa, and then we came down into Colorado. We came in from Nebraska, um, if I remember right, because we stopped in Seward because my oldest brother was starting to look at colleges. He looked at Concordia. And then, uh, well, I didn't pay attention to what roads we took when I was a kid. I mean, what kid does, right? Maybe some of your kids do, but I didn't. But I think we probably took I-80, obviously, and then we got off of I-80, went down 76, and then we took Highway 34 Green, over Greeley and then Loveland into Estes Park and then into Rocky Mountain National Park, which was what we wanted to do first. That was the first place we were headed is Rocky Mountain National Park. And what a day it was when we arrived. What a Day. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. I remember the sky blue, not a cloud in the sky. It was clear. We were traveling west in the mountains, though we, they were quite a distance away still. It was like you could just reach out and touch them. It, it was it's something I had never seen before. Of course, I had seen pictures. I'd seen on TV, but to actually see them live, it was beautiful. I didn't want to leave Colorado. I remember my parents, as we spent time in the, in the mountains, that vacation, I remember my parents talking here and there about the beauty of God's creation. They talked about God's majesty and his power. And I just remember wanting to stay up in those mountains longer than our vacation would allow. There are mountains all over our readings today. We hear of Moses on Mount Nebo. And God gave Moses the view of the promised land from that vantage point above Mount, on the top of Mount Nebo, Nebo just before he buried Moses in the valley below. Sometimes I think it's sad that God didn't allow Moses to see the promised land. I mean, look, he used him to take his people out of Egypt and went through all those plagues. He finally got him out of Egypt and he threw the uh, parting of the Red Sea and then into up, almost up into the promised land. But then they didn't believe God. They didn't trust him. And so I said, all right, 40 more years you're going to wander. Or like, so Moses was lit with them and leading them while they complained all the time for 40 years. Finally got him up on the east side of the Jordan River. And God says, nope, you're not going in. I understand why. He disobeyed God. He rebelled against God's authority. I understand that. But wow, oh, wow, after all that, you would think God would allow him to go in the promise. No, no, he didn't. But then I think, well, wait a minute. Yes, he did. Moses stood on the top of Mount Hermon several, th uh, several hundred years later in the promised land with Elijah when Jesus was transfigured right before him. What a day that was for Peter. What uh, day. I mean, I was excited to be in the Rocky Mountains, but can you imagine how much more even Peter was excited to be on the Mount Hermon, Mount of Transfiguration, and seeing what he was seeing? Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. I think that, here, there it is. Let us make three tents, and actually they're tabernacles. The Greek talks about tabernacles. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not even knowing what he was saying. As he was saying these things, a cloud came over and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Usually on Sunday mornings, we have the haze machine going as you walk into church. Do you ever wonder why? It's not, yeah, okay, yes. It is a little bit to set up a, a sensory experience to be here, and that's good. That's fine. You know, you take it or leave it, right? But I also like it that there is a theological connection to that haze machine, because we're in the Old Testament and the New Testament, as you see the Mount of Transfiguration, where there was a cloud that would come upon God's people, or especially on his son, that was the signal for the presence of the Lord. Something big was about to happen. So I kind of like the theological connection for us to use a haze machine that reminds us that in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, presence of God is here in this place. And think about what Peter was going through that day when he was seeing Jesus being transfigured. Can you even imagine what that would have been like? I, I have to be honest, no. I can't imagine. I mean, we won't have to imagine it when we get into heaven. But we have to do our best to talk about it, to read it. I don't know, make movies. Maybe this video helps a little bit.
Then Jesus took John and James and Peter with him and went up a hill to pray. And while he was praying, the aspect of his face changed its appearance and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah who appeared in heavenly glory. You will fulfill God's purpose. You will die in Jerusalem. As they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, how good it is that we are here. We will make three tents. One for you. As Peter spoke, one a cloud Moses, came and overshadowed them. And one for Elijah. And the disciples were afraid. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. I don't know, maybe I'm a little overly critical, but did that video do it justice? Not in the way I'm thinking of. I'm thinking about Peter and seeing what he's seeing, and the Bible says he was, he was so excited that he was talking out of his mind. He didn't even know what he was saying, basically. He wanted to stay up on that mountaintop for a long time, and he wanted to set up tabernacles. Tabernacles, where do we hear that before? He had just seen the holiness and the glory of God, and Peter had a proper response. The proper response when seeing and witnessing the glory of God is to worship. That's what the psalmist today says as well. Exalt the Lord our God. That means lift up the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. There's another mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. Do you see why this psalm is suggested to be read on Transfiguration Sunday? Let's read it together out loud. I know we already did it earlier in the service, but it's good to read repetitions, the mother of education, they say. Let's read it out loud together and see if you can envision Peter actually using the words of the psalmist on Mount Hermon. Are you ready? Here we go. Uh, next slide. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. And finally, our Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy." The Psalm 99 is called a messianic psalm, Messiah, a royal psalm, right? Because it talks about a king, and we know that King Jesus is the Messiah who fulfilled those Old Testament prophecies of the king that we find in the Psalms. Think about this. So taking Psalm 99, putting it into the New Testament, you can almost hear Peter saying these things. Jesus reigns. Now Jesus sits upon the cherubim in heaven, not upon in the, on the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. Now that he has accomplished the salvation of the world on Mount Zion, Jerusalem, Jesus was exalted over all the people at his ascension, lifted up. He is holy. He came to bring justice for us as chosen people. And on the last day, he will judge all people with equity, with fairness. He knew Moses and Aaron and Samuel and Elijah even before he took on flesh and was born as Jesus of Nazareth. God does not need to speak to us in a cloud anymore. Why? Because now he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. 
God took out his revenge. You know, he says he's, he executed avenge or revenge on his, on his people, on their sins. Well, God now has taken revenge on his son, Jesus Christ, for us when he paid the penalty of death for all of our sins. And that's why we are forgiven of our sins. Therefore, let us lift up the Lord our God and worship him everywhere. He is perfect. He is righteous. He is holy other. He is holy. Brothers and sisters, I wish we could all have a Mount of Transfiguration experience, that mountaintop experience. And sometimes we've tried to recreate it with, in one way or the other, but not until heaven will we really have that same type of experience like Peter, James, and John did. If you're like me, sometimes worship can become humdrum, right? It's like almost wrote, kind of like going through the motions, right? It can happen. Why is that? Well, we fail to remember that the Lord reigns, that he is holy, that he is king over all creation. But when we start focusing on that again, then we'll have the proper res response. We will have awe and reverence and godly fear, even godly fear. He alone is worthy of all of our worship. He alone is worship worthy of all of our praise and our prayer and our devotion. So as we go into the Lenten season this week, let's remember that. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask him to put that into our hearts and to our minds, that God is holy. He is king of overall creation. He has done mighty things. The mightiest is sending his son to, to die on the cross and raising him from the grave. Let's pray. Lord God, when worship starts to become humdrum in our lives, remind us, Lord, of your mighty acts, the mightiest one of your son. Help us to praise you always because you're worthy of our praise, because you are Lord of all creation. You reign over all. And Lord, help us by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak that good message, that good news to all who will listen to us inside this place and outside this place as well. Until that day, Lord, when you come again with glory, you send your son Jesus in glory to raise the dead, to separate the believers from the unbelievers, and to bring in, to usher in the new heavens and the new earth where we will live forever with you in glory. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.